We're doing a study on the book of Job. We're calling it Triumphing Over Trouble. And I hope you are learning the ways to victory, the ways to faith, the way that God intended for us to live the spiritual life, to triumph over our troubles. The lesson that we're going to deal with today is dinosaurs and dragons, dinosaurs and dragons. And I think you'll understand as we go into the lesson why I entitled this one that way. Job has gone through a lot of experiences and God has began speaking with him. And Job has admitted that he has spoken ignorantly about things that he should not have been talking about. Oh, we've all made that mistake, haven't we? But God's not finished with him. God is determined that Job is going to see the pride that is in his heart. Now, you remember in our lesson on Elihu, the young man that addressed Job, he pointed this out. This is basically your problem, Job, is your pride, your pride. Now, what what Job has done, Job has complained because God wouldn't speak to him. Where is God when I'm hurting? But now that God is speaking, suddenly Job doesn't want to say anything. He gets quiet. That's the way we are, isn't it? When God begins to reveal himself to us, we feel so foolish and we realize our sin and it makes us want to get quiet. God was teaching Job, mankind's problem is not that he's too small. His problem is he's too big. Now, by saying big, I'm talking about Pride, pride. We think we know more than we actually know. We think we're smarter than we actually are. And so this is what he's talking about. Your problem is pride. And that's the first part of the lesson I want to to illustrate. The problem of pride. What is pride? Pride is our attempt to play God. Now, so many people would never confess that, but the truth is, We've all tried that from time to time. Even good people, even religious people do that. And uh, we're actually, we call it praying, but we're actually trying to tell God what he needs to do. It's our attempt to play God. So God deals with Job with a natural illustration that he understands. And you'll find this in Job, the 40th chapter and verse 15. God says to him, look now at behemoth, which I have made along with you. Then he addresses another animal. Can you draw Leviathan out with a hook or snare his tongue with the line which you lower? Now, what's he talking about? We're really not sure. But these are the largest of land and sea creatures. Whatever they are, Job knows what they are. He knows what God is talking about. We still debate that. Uh, what is behemoth and Leviathan? Uh, we're, 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 we're really not sure, but it was some kind of large animal. And he uses both the, the sea animals and the land animals to illustrate it. Now, there have been so many guesses about what it was. Uh, they, they have guessed dragons and dinosaurs, and that's the reason I use that. For our title, Uh, they talk about hippopotamuses, they talk about elephants, they talk about the crocodile, they talk about whales, all the different... But the truth is, nobody can prove exactly what these animals were. Some of the things that this descriptive is descriptive of things we know, but other things, he says, are not descriptive of things we know. And so that's not the point. The point is... Whatever they were, they were the greatest of all the created beings, the biggest. Why is he doing that? He's saying, you've got a similar problem to these animals, Job. A similar problem. It's your pride. Like these animals, Job is too big. His problem is a problem of pride. That's where sin comes from. Sin comes out of pride. Strife comes out of 
pride. It all began at the throne of God with one we call Lucifer. Lucifer, that was not a bad word. It is for us today uh, because of of who he became. But uh, Lucifer simply meant the morning star, the morning star. But when he began to pretend, I will be like the most high. I will exalt myself above. His problem was pride. Pride. And that is what is passed down. Every sinner, everyone that is sinning and doing wrong, the root problem comes back to pride. To pride. Whatever these animals were, they were too great for men to tame them. I use a picture here of a horse and... uh, We know that horses can be broken. They can be trained to obey their masters, but not with Behemoth and Leviathan. Whatever these animals were, they were so large, so great, no man can tame them. Now, that's not only true of these animals. It's true of us. We have a similar nature. People fight with each other. They fight with God. You're never going to win that battle, but we do it over and over again because of our proud nature. We're trying to prove we are right. Everybody else is wrong. So this is what Job has been doing. Job finds himself resisting and fighting with God, and that is a mistake. And yet we've all been guilty of that. The story of Jacob illustrates this so well. Jacob, the word Jacob literally means a deceiver, one that will trip his own brother. And that's what he did. Jacob's life was constantly in a fighting mode. It's aggression. And I see so many people, that's the way they look at life. It's us against them. That's a bad way to live. a life of adversary, a life of constant conflict. That's a terrible, terrible way to live. The only way that we're going to change that is we've got to be born again of God's nature. God is a God of peace, not a God of wrath, of anger. His nature is peace. And he wants to bring that into our lives. Now, why is it that we think that we know more than God thinks? If we would stop and just think rationally for just a moment, we have to admit that is not true. None of us know more than God does. There's so much that we do not know. And yet, if we're not careful, we put ourselves in that position of trying to tell God what to do, how to run the universe, where he made mistakes, how that we could have done it better. Why do we do this? Why do we think that our heart is more pure than God's heart? It isn't. Let me tell you, friend, the best thing that you can ever do with your life is live your life as close as you can to the center of God's will. That's the best thing that you can do. Why? Because God is wiser than you. Because God is more righteous than you. Everything about God is greater than ourselves. And so the best thing that we can do is submit ourselves to God's will and live according to it. And we'll live on a higher plane. We will live a better life than we could ever live on our own. But poor Job. He's been fighting, quarreling with God. These thoughts originate out of our pride. It's only through pride that we find producing this kind of strife within our life. Now, in Job's life, there was basically two main attacks that came upon him. And then the third attack was more subtle, which came through his friends. But the two attacks that Satan had made upon him was, he's going to curse God if you will do this. He's saying this to God. God, Satan is challenging God. He will curse you to your face if you do this. He didn't do it. Instead, he praised God. But then, because of the erosion of time and his friends with their false accusation, he falls into depression. 
Oh, may God help us. That's a terrible, terrible place to be. Terrible place to be. And I, I've seen, in fact, most people will suffer with some battles with depression sometime in their life. But uh, some people suffer much more than others do. When you fall into depression, it's very easy to do like Job and start accusing God of mismanaging the universe. Now, that's not rational thinking, but depression always causes you to think irrationally. I, I remember a friend of mine that we were talking about, a man that had just committed suicide, and what a terrible experience it was for his wife to find him in that condition after he had committed suicide. And my friend said to me, he said, I thought, why would anybody do that? Why would he? He, he knows his wife's going to find his body. Why would he put her through that? And then he said, I suddenly realized, I'm thinking rationally. Anybody that's committing suicide is not thinking rationally. And that is the truth. That is the truth. It is out of their depression. And so this is where Job is. And so Job begins to feel like God has failed him. Now, if we will be honest with ourselves, we've probably all been there at one time or another, that we wonder why God allowed this to happen. Why did God permit this to take place? Well, I know that I have, and I've struggled with that. The truth is, pain brings things out of us that pleasure never could. Pain, the, the, the painful experiences in life, as someone has said, we learn more through our defeats than we do our victories if we survive and continue on because we learn what not to do. And that is the basic element of knowledge is knowing what not to do. Job, though, Job in his pain is blaming God. We learn more about ourselves through our Failures than we do through our success, through our failure, our, our, than we do through victory. Now, the big question, the greatest question in life is not, why do I hurt? Why am I hurting? That's not the big question. The big question is, do I still believe? And that's what God begins to challenge Job. The question is not, uh, Where is God when I am hurting? No. What is the big question? The big question is, where am I when I'm hurting? God is changing Job's total perspective on life. And he's having to look at life from God's perspective rather than from his perspective. Stop questioning God. Start asking yourself, Do I still believe? Do I still have faith in God? Let me show you this verse of scripture in 1 Peter 1 and 7, where Peter is talking about what he calls the trial of our faith. The trial of our faith. He said that the genuineness of your faith, though it is tested by fire. The genuineness of your faith. In other words, some people think they believe, but when they get in the test, they discover their faith wasn't as great as they thought it was. Some people think they're following God until they get into a problem, a trouble, and then suddenly they turn and go the opposite direction. They discovered things in their life that they didn't even know was there. Now, that's always a, 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 a terrible, terrible experience when you are tested and you find things inside of you. I, I, I'm thinking now of some experiences in my life that the painful experience brought things out of me that I didn't even know was inside me. That's what's happening with Job. But he said, what God is looking for is the genuineness of your faith. God doesn't want a false faith. He wants a real faith. How are we going to know that it's real? It has to be tested. That's the only way that we're going to know if it is real. The reason why God allows our faith to be tested 
is so it will continue to grow. Now, most people would say that they wish they had a, a greater walk with God, that they were more spiritual, that they, they knew God better. But the truth is, most people are not willing to pay the price to get there. They're not willing to go through what it does. And so I've come to the conclusion that basically we have all of God that we really want of God in our lives. Because if we want more, then we will be willing to follow him, even through the fire, through the test. In the book of Luke, he talks about Simon Peter. Jesus says these words. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, pay close attention to the words of Jesus here. Satan has asked, he's desired you, put you in his hands, that he can sift you as wheat. Now, someone has well said that when you look at trials, you look at the troubles that come upon our life, when God tests us, He sifts us to sift out all the bad things and to leave the good. The devil does exactly the opposite. When Satan wants to sift us as wheat, he's trying to sift out everything that's good and only leave the bad. That is a wise way to look at it. And so Jesus said, Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. And then he goes on to say, But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Thank God for that. Thank God that Jesus Christ is our intercessor. Thank God he's our high priest at the throne of God that's always making intercession for us. Thank God that Jesus is praying for us. Thank God he prayed for Peter because after Peter was tested, yes... And he denied Christ. Do you remember the story? Three times he denied that he knew him. But Jesus wasn't finished with him. He sifted out the bad and kept the good. And he brought back Peter and made him the preacher on the day of Pentecost at the birth of the church. I mean, it it, it was amazing how that God used the man's life. And so what Jesus is saying, Jesus looks into the future. And he sees the increasing evil that's going to happen on planet Earth. And he asks the big question. The big question is, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he's talking about himself, when I return, will he really find faith on the Earth? That's what he's looking for. That's what he wants in our lives. That, that's, that's what he's trying to produce in our Christian life is a life of faith, a life of trust, a life of belief. Will he really find faith? I want him to find faith in my life. Now, here's here's the point I want to make. When there is no opportunity to doubt, there is no opportunity to believe either. See, the bigger the test in your life, the greater the accomplishment in your life. Now, as yet, in the story, we've not been able to see what God's purpose was in all of this. But God's purpose was for good. And the reason he allowed his faith to be tested was so that he could have a greater faith. And that's exactly what God wants to do in our lives. Faith always demands a risk. There's always a risk that's involved. Like the story of Peter walking on the water. Everybody wants to walk on the water, but nobody wants to get out of the boat. Nobody wants to get their feet wet. There's always a risk that is involved in faith. There's an uncertainty. There's confusion. Now, why does God permit that? So that our faith will continue to grow to a higher and higher level of faith. See, the truth is, the Bible offers us many proofs of God's concern, but it gives us no guarantees, none whatsoever. It wouldn't be faith if he did. Yes, I am very certain that I'm going to heaven. 
I'm very certain that my name is written in the book of life, that one day I will stand before Christ. I'm going to hear him say, well done. What's between here and there? I don't know. Only God knows. But I must choose to trust him with everything. The good, the bad, the ugly. I must learn to trust God. See, if we had guarantees, the guarantee would destroy the need to believe. Why do you need to believe? Why do you need to trust? If you already have the guarantee, you don't. And that's the risk that is involved. See, when you search the scriptures, you're going to discover the scriptures are as wise in their reservations as they are in their revelations. They're just as wise in the things God doesn't tell us as the things he does tell us. There are things that we have to learn To trust. Someone has said trust is actually a higher level of faith. Faith is an active verb, whereas trust is, they say, like tying a knot in the end of the rope and holding on. The emphasis is tie the knot and hold on. You don't let go. When you you have no reason to believe what you believe, when everything is against your faith, but you won't let it go, trusting in God. So there are many things that God does not tell us. God does not. If he did, there would be no test. And if there was no test, our faith could not grow. If Job could have only seen the scene that you and I saw take place in heaven in chapter 1 and chapter 2, then there would have been no test in his life. There wouldn't have been any test. There would have been no need for the trial because Job already has the inside information. He already heard what the devil has accused him of, and he would have laughed in the devil's face. But Job doesn't know that. And that is what makes this a real test. It's because of what he doesn't know. Now, that's true in our lives. It's what we don't know. That's the test, the trial in our life. So God help us to respond in faith, in faith. It's Job's faith that is at stake. But even though it was tested, thank God it did not fail. Uh, this, 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 This is so personal to me because this is the way I've chosen to live my life. This is what uh, the Apostle Paul calls in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, walking by faith and not walking by sight. Um, I've had to deal with the IRS a few times, and they want to know how much is the income going to be, how much are you going to be receiving the, you know, this year. I haven't a clue. I don't have any idea. Now, I can go back and tell you what I have been receiving, what has been coming in, and it gives you some kind of guide mark. But uh, I, I was wanting to build a house in Arkansas one time, and I went to the banker, and the banker is wanting me to tell, well, how much is your income going to be the rest of the year? I don't know. Uh, There's no way I, I, because it's what we call living by faith. Living by faith. And it's been my lifestyle since I was just a teenager. I started living this way. If we walk by sight, what we can see, there's no faith that is involved in that. Now, thank God Job, though he's, his faith's tested, but it doesn't fail. It remembers, uh, it remains. For instance, in Job 19, verses 25 and 26, you hear him saying, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand on the last day on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. That's faith. That's faith. But there's no way that you can prove that You have to learn to trust God. Now, the second part of this lesson I want to focus on is what I'm going to call the power of praise. The power of praise. True faith doesn't try to manipulate God into doing what we want. True faith brings us into a place of doing God's will. Or as I said, the key is learning 
how to trust God. In trusting God. How, how, how do we do that? Faith becomes the best way to express our love for God. If you want to express your love for God, believe. Trust Him. Put your confidence in Him. That's the best way to express your love for Him. In Galatians 5 and 6, he says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. He's simply saying, keeping the law of Moses or breaking the law of Moses. That is not what's important. What is important? Faith which works by love. Boy, that that is making it simple, isn't it? That's putting it in our life. You see, the truth of it is, it seems like we must experience Job-like experiences to nurture our intimacy with God. Or another way of saying it is, we need problems just as much as we need solutions. Solutions in our life. We need the problem, the test, because that's what helps us grow. A faith like Job's faith cannot be shaken because it is the result of being shaken. That's why he became so strong and God was able to give him twice as much as he had before. I love the illustration of the little child. The little child, the more we become Christ-like, the more we become like little trusting children. Trusting God even though intellectually... We can't even define the problem, but we trust him anyway. The more like Satan we become like, the more we become like selfish little children. That's that's a good example of what God wants to do in our life. That's what is called the full circle of maturity. You start out as a child, you end up as a child, but there's a difference. The difference is the trust has come to maturity in God. You now, you've gone through a lot of experiences. The child has not. He starts in innocence. But we have learned through experiences. We can still trust him. Matthew, the 18th chapter and verse 3, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say unto you, unless you are converted and become as little children. What does he mean by that? You learn to be trusting like a child. You learn to trust God. Unless you become as a little child, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Job responds to God and he says, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this that hide counsel without knowledge? In other words, himself. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes." That's what God was looking for. That's what God was seeking all the time in Job's life was repentance. And his repentance was complete. He has humbled himself before God and admitted, I have spoken foolishly about things I didn't know what I was talking about. And I repent. I'm so sorry for what I have become. Now we know. He's free from pride. Why? Because pride makes repentance impossible. You're never going to see a proud man truly repenting. No, because they don't think they need it. Everybody else needs it. Pride is no longer controlling his life. And so he humbles himself and he repents broken before God. Something that I notice here in his words is that his revelation of God has doubled. That had to take place before God could double all the substance in his life. 
the revelation is doubled. He said, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And because of this revelation, I see myself and I repent. See, God help us. God help us to experience this in our lives and understand the trials that we have. They were good for us because they helped us to grow. Praise becomes the expression of our faith to the God that we love. I I remember in my life a personal experience that happened many years ago. I was praying and asking God to increase love in my life. I was saying, God, please give me greater love, greater love. I want to love you like I've never loved you before. Teach me how to love like you love. And, And I was sincere. I meant that. And my, instead of love, I, I had one of the most terrible experiences happen to me. I just, it, it broke my heart. And I can still remember driving down the road. I was driving in Ohio and I'm driving down the road and I'm crying. And I'm crying out to God and I'm saying, Oh God, why did you allow this to happen? And then I reminded God of my prayer. I ask you to give me greater love and now... My heart is broken. Why did you allow this to happen? God spoke to me very, very tenderly, like a father would speak to a hurting child. I heard God speak to me and say, I allowed your heart to be broken so I could put it back together bigger. I've never forgot those words. In other words, my heart was already full of love. If he's going to give me any more love, i got to experience a broken heart so he can put it back together bigger. That's exactly what is going on in Job's life. Now we're seeing the end of the story. And we're beginning to understand why God permitted this in the first place. It was because Job's life was full. And the only way that God can give him more, he has to take the fence down so he can put it back up bigger. His revelation of God has doubled. And by that, now God can begin to bless him and give him more than he's ever had before. That's what God wants to do in our lives. This is a good example of how God wants us to develop in our faith walk with him. And so I pray that you're learning through Job's experience how to triumph over your troubles, how to become victorious. And you're realizing you need to look at life through God's eyes, not your eyes. Look at life through heaven's perspective and will help you continue to grow in your faith. And you too will triumph over your troubles.